Hello, Renegade Marketers. Welcome to Renegade Marketers Unite, the top-rated podcast for B2B CMOs and other marketing-obsessed individuals. All right, you are about to listen to a recording of Renegade Marketers Live, our live show featuring the CMOs of CMO Huddles, a community that's sharing, caring, and daring each other to greatness every day of the week. This time, we've got Ali McCarthy of Skyance, Grant Johnson of Embers, and Andrew Halley of Mark Forge for a conversation on SaaS marketing. It's a great episode, so let's get to it. Hello, I'm your host, Drew Neiser, live from my home studio in New York City. Just two decades ago, if someone said SaaS, as in enough with your SaaS, Drew, we would have had a shared understanding of its meaning and it would have unlikely that SaaS would have been the topic of a marketing show. Today, however, SaaS, as in software as a service, is a $145 billion, I want just $145 billion industry that touches just about every aspect of our work lives. Consider just this show. My notes are created on Google Docs. The meeting invites were sent out via Office 365. We're using Restream to broadcast it live onto four different viewing platforms. We'll transcribe the show using Otter AI. We'll rebroadcast it as a podcast uh, using Lipson, a syndication service. And we'll track social sharing via Sprout Social. And I protect my logins to all of these applications via Dashlane. And no doubt, I probably missed five SaaS applications that we use along the way. Every one of these applications is subscription-based, exists in the cloud, and almost all are minting money for their respective owners. In fact, you would be hard-pressed to find a successful software product right now that is either fully SaaS today or in the process of migrating to SaaS. So let's move on to the real topic today, the not so obvious challenge of being a CMO at a SaaS company, particularly one that is in massive growth mode. And to help us understand what makes SaaS marketing such a distinct challenge, we have three amazing CMOs. Grant Johnson is the CMO at Imburse. Um, and in addition to his many accomplishments, he was the star of episode 13 of this show and is a two-time a uh, guest of Renegade Marketers Unite. So hello, Grant. How are things in sunny Southern California? Uh, they're, of course, uh, sunny and bright and uh, beautiful. And, uh, you know, winter may show up one day, but uh, all good. What's the hurry, right? Uh, you know, it's it's overrated. So, all right. Well, let's talk about your marketing career. And, I, and you know, both of our careers started before SaaS was a thing. And I'm just curious, was it at Pega or an earlier stop when, when SaaS became sort of the, the hot topic in the C-suite? Yeah, I think it was at Pega Systems right around, you know, the 2010 timeframe. But, you know, interestingly enough, Drew, we all have, you know, journeys that uh, take us into different directions. And back in 2002, I joined a company called Big Fish Enterprises. You may not have heard of them. And I had the fun uh, opportunity of renaming them to Frontbridge. And we were actually an early SaaS company. It wasn't called SaaS, but it was a hosted a, a message management filter spam or viruses like it's done today. Uh, it was all done. You could set it up in a matter of 30 minutes. We had a free trial. Uh, we converted 90% of free trials and we retained 90% of the customers. And uh, Microsoft bought the company in 2005. So it's been a, a fun SaaS journey. So, wow, okay, that's, that was 16 years ago. You don't have SaaS till you have internet, so there's really only, if we look at it, 26 years of this to, to begin with. So um, early entrance, but I know that Pega in particular was a company that wasn't SaaS. And so I'm curious is how that sort of, as you're there and it's like, oh my God, there's this SaaS thing. We got to solve for this. Yeah, exactly. We, you know, we had noticed Adobe was an early pioneer in making that shift in their business model. We were moving more and more in the early 2000, 2013 timeframe to subscription. Now, if you look, they're over a billion dollars. You look at Pegasystems, uh, SaaS and deferred revenue is larger and larger. And in my last several years, I've been, you know, purely in SaaS. It's like at some point, as you said at the outset, Drew, it's the only way to go. And I'm wondering, so when we first talked on my podcast, you were at Kofax, and that was 
like a hardware company initially, right? Well, before I got there, I probably wouldn't have joined, I'll be honest with you. They'd sold off the hardware and they were moving okay. to SAS and it had a, bought a couple companies and we bought uh, and merged together with uh, Kofax Perceptive and a company based out of uh, Sweden called Readsoft. And they had pioneered a, a, a AP automation invoice processing offering called Readsoft Online. And it was pure SaaS. You could set it up in a few minutes, no, almost no administration required. So that Kofax, just like Pega, was in that transition from on-premise to hybrid to try to get more and more revenue uh, out of subscriptions. And part of this is helping us understand what's the biggest difference as a marketer. I mean, you know, in the way you might have done it when it was, you know, not uh, it was an on-premise thing. I mean, we used to buy disks and we put them on our computer, and or they would sit on a server somewhere uh, locally. What's the big difference from a marketing standpoint when it comes to SaaS? One word, agility. As I've reflected on my journey, my team's journey, how we go to market, how we compete, the, the, the dynamic nature of, of the, the offers, uh, you have to be able to adapt your value prop, your website, your customer acquisition, all these things really fast because, you know, tomorrow somebody uh, comes up with a freemium that you were charging for, or they bundle something like, let's say we're, we're in the expense and spend management business and suddenly you can now do bill pay. Well, yesterday you couldn't do bill, bill pay. So that adds to your value prop. So you just have to have that mindset. And, and in the on-premise, you know, you could make decisions and move, you know, I wouldn't say annually, but at least, you know, you could wait a quarter to take action. You know, now if you, if you wait a, a, a month, it's too long. You know, a week may seem too long to some of us. So interesting. Okay. And, and that helps. And, and it's purely because the market is so dynamic. Um, your products are so dynamic. Uh, and, and so obviously the competitor can come in. And you use the term freemium. And that's often what is talked about. We're going to talk about that later. But I, I, at some point, how do you avoid, and that whenever we're talking agility, the downside of agility is, you know, you're just all over the place. You're ricochet rabbit, you're responding and you're not leading. And, and it's really hard in that context to think about brand and marketing. Are we just working our way from campaign to campaign and messaging to messaging? How, how do you sort of keep that in the context of, well, we got to build a brand too. Well, it's the true north. It's the constant. You know, we, we uh, launched a campaign uh, to verbify and burst called Inverse It last quarter. We, we've done a lot on social media. We're doing a lot with our customers. We'll have uh, conferences and campaigns all around the building the brand, the, you know, the awareness, the affinity, uh, the advocacy around Inverse. Um, so that'll be a constant. And we also have uh, campaigns that are ongoing that we do for each of the major segments. But a lot of the tactics to, to acquire a particular customer or to upsell or to cross sell, those have much more uh, variation and allow for experimentation and uh, sort of this more flexible approach to where you do have to maintain that constant brand presence. And, and, and the other you know, key dimension I found with SaaS is the the inordinate importance of the customer experience. You have to deliver, the expectations have been elevated with the Facebooks and Amazons of the world that business applications shouldn't have to be hard and difficult to use and non-intuitive, right? We have that mindset that we have to continue to streamline and simplify and support our customers in their journey to adopt our products. And so they'll be happy with that experience and tell other customers about it. So, and I guess it, before we sort of, get move on overall is this easier harder or just different from a marketing I standpoint i think it's more challenging but in a, in a in an exciting way right you have to be on your toes and agile and adaptive and uh, willing to to take risk uh that's you know key component of being a cmo is to make the right bets and you know make some calculated ones um, and, you know, make some smaller ones, too, that, hey, if they go south, uh, no harm, no foul. Love it. OK. All right. We're going to come back to you. But right now we're going to move to Allie McCarthy, CMO of Skyence. Allie, hello. Hi. How are you? <laughs> Good. Great and happy to be here. Nice to be you. And so where are you? 
I'm in Downingtown, Pennsylvania, so it's about 40 miles west of Philadelphia. West of Philadelphia. Okay. All right. Well, so um, before we talk about Skyants, you were at Brinker Capital for like six years. And and I'm just curious because that, that's a sort of interesting and different type of place than what you're doing with Skyants. Talk a little bit about that. Sure. So I've always been on the traditional uh, investment management side of the business. So Brinker Capital being a investment management firm itself, I really have kind of grown up through that, if you will, uh, my career. And it's been learned so much. What was interesting about my tenure there, not only was I continuing to manage the marketing, but then was able to layer in additional things like practice management, really understanding how the advisor and client relationship works and really helping advisors grow their business through deepening their relationships with their clients. So when Grant was talking about the customer experience, really having this hands-on approach of being able to understand how those conversations happen between a financial advisor and their client, and then how to deepen those. So that was a wonderful experience and really allowed me to kind of step outside of just traditional investment marketing. I also was able to finish my doctoral work while I was there. It's advanced studies in human behavior, but I studied um, the emotional intelligence level of a financial advisor and how it impacts their relationship with their clients. So it was really- EQ. EQ, yeah. Wow, very cool. If we said, all right, give me a polar opposite of (laughs) stats, which is, you know, sometimes customer goes and discovers it on his own. They click, they might never actually talk to a person. Whereas investment management is all about that one-on-one. And how were you able to sort of make this leap into, into SaaS? It's funny you say that because that was one of the things that I thought was so interesting about making the move over. So what was familiar to me was that we serve the same clients. So at Skyens, it still serves the wealth management industry, but instead of just focusing on the financial advisor and the client relationship, it's really looking at um, digital enablement at the firm level. And so how can you help provide a better experience to the compliance folks, to the back office staff, to the advisor's assistant, down to the advisor and the client? So it was really at a much bigger level Uh, but really staying in a space that I was really familiar and comfortable with. So a little bit of the blend. There's a little bit of leap of faith there that some of the jargon I hadn't really mastered yet, but I think, I think I'll get it. It's fine. Well, and so (laughs) I'm here talking SAS. Yeah, right. Exactly. No. And and we're going in with confidence because we know how important that is now. And what's interesting to me is the target, you know, the companies, the world that to whom you are selling. The whole sort of SaaS sales motion is what would be new. And so talk a little bit about how you've gotten up to speed because you've been there now six months and how that's going in terms of, you know, what are you seeing Right. That's sort of different. And, and you go, oh, man, OK. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because as I was thinking about that, as I was preparing to have this discussion with you, what I was surprised about what was how it is in some ways similar in the sense that in the SaaS world, you are trying to land and expand. And in when we were working with financial advisors, we were selling such an array of products that we were actually taking that same approach with them. So we were also trying to get in there and then expand the relationship once we were in there. So in some ways it is different, but in a lot of ways it's very similar. And you realize that it doesn't really matter what industry you're in, humans are pretty much the same. So we were able to um, kind of get up to speed and and, um, learn the jargon quickly, but I would say, uh, I wasn't as surprised or overwhelmed. I was pleasantly surprised in the sense that some things were very similar. And and so so lots of things like that. But what have you seen that's different? Are you going, oh, what's on the learning curve for you? So on the learning curve, I would say here, they're definitely more advanced on the ABM side because there isn't a group buyer on, on the individual side in, in investment management, at least when you're doing the financial services products per se. So for me, that was something that I found interesting to be able to explore more with my team, really get that up and running and really dive into the, you know, who is the buyer? What is the persona? How are you managing the the firm and the group buyer? And um, that's been fun. 
Yeah, and it's funny that because SaaS is such a massive category, and I mean, I I think there's so many SaaS brands where it is a direct to individual sale, but in a lot of times, and all three of our guests today, we're talking about an enterprise sale where right. it is multiple people, and even though the transactions and the product is ultimately delivered online, and yeah, so it's harder. I guess the difference might be right. I was thinking of a financial advisor might have to sell you know the whole family on the idea but still it's a different thing okay um let's let's move on and we'll we'll keep up let's get on bring on andrew halley cmo at binder and star of episode 248 of renegade marketers unite hello andrew hey drew great to see you again nice to see you and where are you I am in Charlestown, about 50 yards off the monument, just outside of downtown Boston. So just outside. East Coast like you. Yes. So I was reading up about Binder, and I couldn't help but notice in the LinkedIn quote, why, and I'm going to quote, Binder launched in 2013 as a, the first pure SaaS DAM. And DAM standing for, uh, it's not a swear word, digital asset management. And I'm curious does that matter anymore if a company is pure SaaS or, you know, as it does, you know, because I know, I mean, we're talking a little bit about that with Grant and Pega was not pure SaaS, but they got there. Um, but does it matter? I would say it matters most actually operationally behind the scenes of what we as marketers are doing. When you're a, a SaaS vendor, right, you're able to much more scalably uh, develop maintain, enhance, and deploy your software across tens, hundreds, thousands of customers, as opposed to when you don't have SaaS, when it's on-prem or on-prem's awkward cousin, single tenant hosted solutions, the operations are so much more complex. So I think that behind the scenes is much, much harder. And of course, if everything behind the scenes is harder, going more slowly, that kind of slows you down on the marketing side. I, I think another, I would say, Thing that SaaS gives you, and this uh, you touched on this, I think we'll talk about it later too, is, is the whole ability to use um, uh, a trial or freemium as a way to deliver value to the buyer ahead of a sales conversation. You know, when you've got a multi tenant SaaS solution, that's much easier to do. It may still not make, make sense to do, but it's something that you're able to do. As a marketer, when it comes to customer and focusing on expanding accounts, um, a SaaS solution, you can market individual features because there's no necessarily software delivery. You can just turn features on. So it helps you with that customer marketing piece. And then lastly, I think one thing that's that's neat is the whole multi-tenant SaaS revolution, if you want to call it that, since we're here in Boston, is the data that vendors get, right? As the 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 business of running a SaaS solution creates user data. Sometimes it's called the data exhaust, which opens up all kinds of neat possibilities for, for businesses in, in, in value delivery to the customer, but also for marketing and the kinds of benchmarking and interesting insights you can share with buyers, again, delivering value ahead of the sales conversation. So I think it's got some major advantages. Yes. So, okay. I think it's so interesting in, in that once you have a customer in theory, and it's an online based product, I mean, we all experience this with Zoom all the time. It's like, oh, there's a new update, right? And then you open it up and you go, oh, look, there's something new there. Talk a little bit about that aspect of it. And, and this sort of gets me to this whole world that people use the term product led marketing, and they're typically mm. talking about SaaS. And so is that what we're? Is that where the the product and the customer upsell cross that comes together? Yeah, I think it can be. So yeah, so so product -led SaaS, product led growth is a strategy, right? To lower the barrier to start engaging with the customer, to getting a customer, and then grow it, you know, organically by delivering new features and maybe having that kind of customer expansion require less touch as well. Let the software do it as has been done with the initial uh, SaaS purchases in cases. So I think I think that's definitely a tactic that can be done with SaaS. But again, even behind that, the scenes, right, that this that whole notion of deploying um, uh, software and yeah, the customer may click through to get it um, is just operationally so much better. I think even if you're not 
engaging in product-led growth as a strategy. Okay. Before we move on, you mentioned uh, multi-tenant, and I want to make sure we explain what that is and then get, and I love this notion of data exhaust. And I, I remember having a number of conversations with SaaS companies 10 years ago mm-hmm. and saying, the reason you're going to want to give this away is the data is where the real value is. Sometimes that it's all about the data. Um, but talk a little bit, what, is, what does multi-tenant mean? Yeah, sure. So multi-tenant is basically when you can run um, lots of customers on the same unit of infrastructure, if you will, and their customer data are, is partitioned logically in software as opposed to you know single tenant where you basically have to have a machine for each customer. And so it's just, again, it, it's much easier to deal with all the customers in one place rather sure. than having to have separate houses it's kind of like trick-or-treating in an apartment building versus trick-or-treating in a neighborhood, right? And now you got me completely. My kids, we could do, when we lived in a large building, in an hour, they covered so much territory. It was unbelievable. That's hilarious. Okay, and then let's just get at this. from a, How does the data exhaust and all this help you as, as a marketer? And I imagine this becomes a very interesting uh, way. Is it as... We leverage that for content. We leverage that for insight. We leverage it for sales. I mean, talk a little bit about that. I, I think the easiest example from my career was back at uh, Bullhorn, which is software for the recruiting and staffing industry and, and just a great company. We launched a new product, a new service, I should say, called Reach, which is all about helping recruiters figure out how to use uh, social media back when it wasn't so obvious how you use that for recruiting. And uh, they could post their jobs across social networks and get candidates that way. In the process of having hundreds of thousands of recruiters do this, it produced an enormous amount of interesting data about what's the right frequency to post a job on Twitter or LinkedIn. uh, That just by being able to watch all these customers act, we could see what was most effective. And we could do a number of things with that. First of all, we could reflect that in the product by giving tips to the user to help them be more effective in the product. They use the product, they're more effective, they're customers, we grow the account, right? We were also able to start aggregating all this data and we came up with the social recruiting report. And we just gave insights about, you know, by geography, by job type, what's the most effective way to use social media for recruitment? So for example, nursing positions, Facebook was much better than LinkedIn. Uh, just as one example, and that would change. And so that was kind of content marketing. We could break it down by geography and say interesting things about the UK versus the US. And just the audience, our audience ate it up because it was insights into something they were trying to figure out. So a couple of things that I'm I'm thinking of tips within the product, which so you use it better because there's so many times where we have pieces of software that we don't use to its fullest advantage. Um, I'm just wondering, and this is a kind of bizarre technical question, but I'm imagining that the product has to be coded in such a way that that data can be pulled out. It's possible yeah. that data wouldn't be accessible or someone. And as a marketer, how do you make sure that Hey guys, is there any data in there we can use or could you reprogram so that we could get that data? Yeah, that's actually a really important insight, Drew. It, it, it's because I have absolutely been in SaaS situations where that can be dramatically easier or more difficult depend on choices made in architecture that aren't always obvious when mm-hmm. products are first getting built, right? Because you know when you're in that MVP stage, you're just trying to deliver value to the customer. You're not thinking five years down the road when you have hundreds of thousands of users, how might you want to be able to look at data across all that? So often working with data exhaust can either be next to impossible, even in a multi-tenant solution. If the way customer-specific configuration is handled, isn't done well, it can be extraordinarily difficult. With Reach, that was Bullhorn's second SaaS product, the, the, the technical team knew right? What to do to help make that doable. So, you know, the, the company had learned from previous experience, but you're right. That's a really important point. It's not always easy to do, even with a pure SaaS product. Well, and, and I'm just thinking, cause you know, so many times the marketer is at the mercy of the programmer. Uh, and this is just a case where experience matters. Or if you tune into this show, you know, when you go to your NAS SaaS job, <laughs> you know, to ask, oh, by the way, can we pull the data? And if not, can we make sure that's on the roadmap? All right. 
And with that, I want to talk about, because this show is all about sharing. We're going to talk about CMO huddles for a second. Um, we launched CMO Huddles in 2020. It's an invitation-only subscription service that brings together an elite group of CMOs to share, care, and dare each other to greatness. We just had a huddle today, and we were talking about time management because it turns out that most CMOs are working harder than they were, not less. They're working more even though they don't have commute, so it's crazy. Anyway, one CMO described Huddles as timely conversations with smart peers in a trusted environment, while another called it a cross between an expert workshop and a therapy session. If you're a B2B CMO that can share and care and dare with the best of them, visit cmohuddles.com or send me an email at you know, drew at renegade.com and see if you qualify for a guest pass. Grant, Andrew, Allie, I'm just curious, you know, any, Grant, you've been with Huddles for a little bit longer than, than the others. Any thoughts on, on Huddles? Yeah, I mean, you really struck a chord with this. I know it's, uh, you know, precipitated by the pandemic, um, and I've been part, and you and I have known each other for a decade, of other CMO groups. And I think the unique combination of where, you know, we come together monthly, uh, share best practices, challenge and support each other with with our own knowledge that is complementary, um, is a great form. In addition to all the other things like the lives and the bonus huddles, it really has become a you know, valuable part of you know, my, my monthly uh, uh, work life. I love it. Thank you. That's great. Thank you for that. I, I don't know, Andrew, Ali, you want to add anything to this conversation? I would just add that um, it's a community that I, I think I really needed right now. So thank you. And <laughs> um, I would echo what you said. It, you know, it, it's something that I really look forward to. So it helps me fill up. Awesome. Yeah, I've, I've, taken, I've taken a nugget a really valuable nugget, at least one from every huddle that we've had. So I, I, I think it's fantastic. Well, uh, thank you all. So I read that there are 35,000 SaaS products from over 15,000 companies competing in over 740 vertical markets. And so that makes me think there's a lot of brands in every category and the barrier seems to be sh pretty low to entry. So how are you all finding breathing room? And, and, you know, and I'll start with you, Grant, with Embers. It's certainly a, a challenge that uh, persists across, you know, all geos and all, all segments. There's somebody getting funded in what we call broadly the uh, travel and expense uh, spend management category is, is part of the, the broader one. And we find that our targeting to the persona, to the buyer group, uh, our communications and nurturing all the way through, you know, closing and onboarding has to be top drawer. Because if we don't meet that customer expectation, there's not just one, there's 10 other competitors that are vying for their business. Interesting. Um, Ali, how about in your, in your thing? I mean, how are you all finding breathing room for your brand? Sure. We specialize just in the wealth management space. So for us, it's important that we are becoming a consultative, trusted advisor to these firms because digital transformation in the wealth management industry isn't as mature as in some other industries. I mean, there's a lot to unpack and there's a lot of legacy systems, but yet the consumer, we were talking about this earlier that the consumer does demand a seamless experience. So we always want to help them get it right the first time. So we found that if we are a partner to them versus just them looking at us as just a vendor, then it's helping us really give them that roadmap to their long-term success. So that's been a way for us to get some breathing room for our brand. Interesting. I mean, so you're yeah. a trusted advisor to trusted advisors. That's um, right. <laughs> and, uh, and Andrew, I mean, Binder says it. Uh, Binder said it was early to to uh, the the damn category. How did they find their space? Well, actually, Ali mentioned digital transformation. In the case of uh, digital asset management as a category, and Binder, um, this you know digital transformation, the last couple of years of rapid acceleration, right, of the digital economy, really created new challenges. Uh, that DAM can solve for DAM buyers, for the marketing team, and uh, the need to 
provide great digital experience online, the need to uh, serve up images that are personalized, you know, algorithmically driven in real time. It's a very different new uh, set of needs. And so it's some real new space that affords Binder the opportunity to lead the category. And so um, in some ways, you know, digital transformation kind of shook up the snow globe right. of Dan, if you will, and, and afforded Binder some new space to, uh, to differentiate and update positioning. Now, was there ever any talk about renaming the category? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, but I think, you know, Binder uh, has a solid case to be the industry leader, you know, it's certainly an industry leader. And so as industry leader, your job is to grow the category rather than compete down, right, to those chasing you. In this case, it was, we, we did debate that, but it was a pretty easy call that in this case, it really is to um, elevate the damn category and then that we will grow along with it. Yeah, I was thinking more of the fact that it's DAM and, and oh, <laughs> <laughs> but that's okay um, because I just loved hearing you say we got to elevate the damn category and that works for me. So okay, so we we started to get at this issue of of premium and freemium and and I I think about a conversation I had probably two three years back uh, with Megan Eisenberg at MongoDB. And they had, I think, 45,000 downloads a day of their free product. And oh, so the marketing mission one was then basically, can we convert 1% of those into paying customers kind of thing? And I'm curious, do, do e any of you have a version, something that helps you lower the barrier to trial? Oh, Binder has um, a free trial. It's not a full free version, um, and it is available uh, without having a touch with the sales organization. But what we find in practice, Binder actually, the, the free trial is more frequently used after the first sales touch as a way for a customer to uh, try different things. So we actually find it's good for moving the sales process forward. Binder is an enterprise product. Um, key parts of the value are integration into the broader digital ecosystem, things that are difficult to really yeah. provide in a free way. And it's just important. Well, and it, so Grant, let's talk about changing your accounting system or your expense system or any of these things is a big deal. And I guess what kinds of things and how do you think about lowering the barrier to trial? If it's not giving the way a product or a version, what, what do you do in this way to sort of get someone? I mean, I think about HubSpot and what that's meant to them, how they've been able to get to enterprise by individuals with their free trial. Yeah, I mean, I would say two things. One, because Andrew made a really good point that uh, for more complex uh, up market enterprise that you've got to integrate with the information infrastructure of your company that it's just not easy to say, well, here's the freeman. They're not going to be able to see the value, right? So as you go to SMB or even mid-market for us, if, if, if we can show how easy it is to connect uh, to an ERP, QuickBooks could be something for an SMB that's pretty obvious. Then suddenly we see the conversion once they've had that aha moment from trial to subscription. So that really becomes an accelerator for us. So we are looking at next year uh, some other ways to lower the barriers to adoption, but uh, that it definitely is a compelling way to try to address a much broader market and uh, without having to get 45,000 downloads a day. <laughs> But and I think what and I'm, I'm glad I, you you brought that up again because Andrew's point was I thought so interesting and one to keep in mind, which is marketing isn't always and something like a, a trial isn't always just about getting a new customer. It could be about accelerating a deal. And as we think about the role of the CMO, it's not just about getting people into the lead funnel. It's helping close those leads too. So um, interesting point. Allie, anything in this area that you're doing to help lower the barrier? 
Similar to what Grant was saying, we have typically worked with larger enterprises. And as we're going to the RIA market, which is for us would be the SMB market and mid-market area um, of the wealth management industry, we are looking at giving them some opportunities to um, try before they buy. Right. And yeah. and again, I want to make one other point, which is going back to what Grant said in and Andrew said is sometimes the barriers to purchase are the just the multiple parts of adoption. And so you don't, again, it's not just about a freemium product. It is about getting the customer easy, uh, comfortable with this change that so often comes with a new software product. And I, I think there's a good chance for me to ask what Ben Franklin would say. And, and part of this is, I think, in the world of SaaS, there is a tendency to overpromise and underdeliver. And one of the ways that we just talked about it is a way you can sort of match expectations or sort of set expectations is by letting them see uh, under the hood and get to see how things connect. But what Franklin would advise is endeavor to speak truth in every instance and give nobody expectation that it is not likely to be answered but aim at sincerity in every word and action. Now that's a lot longer than his normal quote that I do on the show, but I want to aim at sincerity in every word and action. And really when we talk about marketing today, we are talking about the combination of words and action. Okay, so one, we've talked a little bit about this challenge of this, you know, Grant, you brought it up right away. Agility, needing to be able to, keep up with the, the market um, and how the speed of competition and overnight this there's all this pricing pressure and churn issues and so forth. And I'm just curious as a CMO, how much time do you spend or have your team spend sort of looking at the competition? Yeah, this is a really interesting one. Um, I mean, obviously you got to know about the competition. I, I think the risk, though, is that we hone in too tightly, right, on 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 covering competitive difference, right? I, I don't know. Has has anyone read um, a book called Different: Escape the Competitive Herd? It's by a woman named uh, Young Me Moon. I think she's at HBS. G great book, and that's really Drew. Like she really gets like right at this, and. Um, there's a natural inclination in markets and especially tech, right. To, to reduce differences rather than accentuate them. And that's tough on marketing, but yet in SAS we're it's enterprise software. We're competing. We're going head to head with other vendors and you really have to have deep Intel about the competitor. Cause you can really help the sales team win deals with great competitive intelligence. So on the one hand, it's critical to have it, you know, when you're in the trenches competing. And of course, you want it to guide um, the roadmap, the product roadmap to bridge meaningful reasons why you lose deals repeatedly. But I think there's a risk of holding the comp competition too close in mind when you're trying to create a brand. Yeah. And I, 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 it's kind of a little bit of a, a trap question. I have to admit, as I was asking it, I think about the, the former CEO, he was a marketing guy who became the CEO of Tesco. And he talked about how early in his career, he just kept looking at the competition and trying to keep up with them. And his career didn't accelerate until he started not to even look at mm. what they were doing and just think about what Tesco could do better than anybody else. It's hard to say that to a salesperson and say, sorry, you're losing this deal. But I guess the flip side of that is really understanding why you win deals, right? And recognizing, and it may be that, because if you're all things to all people, it's, it's problematic. And curious, Ali Grant, did you have any thoughts on the competition in this question? The only thing I would add to what you were saying was, I agree that you do have to pay attention to it, but it can't consume you because in, in our, it, it's so dynamic. And you find that who might be your competitor today could be your partner tomorrow. And so I think you almost need to just have knowledge of it just for the relationship 
aspect and being able to understand the collective strengths. Because sometimes we are not the only solution for um, the clients we serve. There are times where we might need to, if we're going to do right by them, that it might be a blend of someone who could be considered a competitor or a partner. And so it's something you can never take your hand off the wheel, correct? But it is something that shouldn't be the only benchmark of, of success. Um, okay. I, I would ahead. add that but both what Ali and Andrew said is uh, we have a director of competitive market intelligence on my team. And, and surprisingly, we use a SaaS app to track competition. There's another one for you, True, Our brand mission is to humanize work, and we want to live that mission in every interaction, uh, on the front lines, on the back office, so that our brand remains distinct. We're not going to win every competitive battle, but we have to stay true to our brand and not just follow suit with what you know several others decide to do on a whim, perhaps. So, and I think that's and this that's a perfect bookend to what you said earlier about agility. Is we can't be reactive in this thing. I mean, we have to be aware of what's going on, but we're also at the same time there are some things that sort of say yes or no. Uh, allow us to sort of let that. Hey, knock yourself out. You all go that way. We're going this way. Um, and and I want to shift gears just a, a little bit to. It's funny, the SaaS world is, is very well known for um, getting customers, you know, the, but they're not as good at servicing them, right? They're good at marketing a service, but not so good at servicing the market, as, as someone said. And I, I'm curious in, in you guys, as you think about both this service part of your business, how does that impact um, some of the decisions that you're, you're making? And, and I mean, did, can you ever take your eye off of acquisition? Can you just sort of say, we really need to spend a little more time on customer service and customer marketing? I think that, that quote, I think it's probably more true in the days before SaaS, right? When it was enterprise software, um, you know, Grant oh, and I remember this. Uh, I'll tell you what, I, I see so many SaaS products that use Zendesk, which I have just, I have terrible experience. I never get an answer that I need. And I'm probably one of only... Mm. Folks, I have, you know, I'm sure that at some point Zendesk is going to jump on this show and say, Drew, you're an idiot. But every time, so to me, when I have a SaaS product and I have an issue, if I can't get a real person on the line, mm. and that's a lot, I find I am just stuck. And so anyway, mm. that's, I think what we're talking about more of individuals trying to get customer support on a SaaS product. Forget about it. I see. Yeah. So it's the scale problem of having millions of customers. Because I think in the enterprise space, right, SaaS, where the barriers are lower to leaving than they were with on-premise software, right? And it's a subscription service. You're, you're winning that business every year. I think SaaS actually, from an enterprise, Drew, not, not the individual user, as you're mentioning, actually has led our industry to better service the customer. We're fighting for that renewal. It's easier for customers to churn. NRR is a critical metric that is right next to a pipeline on, I think, the modern SaaS business executive dashboard these days. Okay. All right. Well, you heard that here. We're spending time on this. We're keeping our customers. 2022 is going to be the year of the customer. So let's Let's talk about final words. We're running out of time here. Um, we'll start with Al. For the SaaS marketers who are here, give us just sort of one key thought to be thinking about as you head into 2022. Well, I think as we head into 2022, we should never lose sight that the customer and the client, they're first. And, you know, we need to approach everything we're doing now really with empathy more than we ever had. I mean, we went through a lot and we're not out of it yet. And so I think we need to just keep our eyes and our gaze on our clients and where they are and how best we can serve them. Because I think you're right. If you're looking at the competition, that's one thing. But if you're looking at where the evolving road that our clients are going to, I think that's more important. And I think it's the right North Star for all the firms in our category. Okay, Grant, thank you for that, Allie. Grant? Well, in 2022, 2022, you don't have to be a horse whisperer, but you, you do have to remain, as Allie said, to be a really good listener. The, the answers are there, and uh, your customers are, are willing to share. You've just got to open up the dialogue. 
and then double down where you're strong, be true to your brand, uh, accentuate your differentiation. And uh, there's lots of upside if you follow those uh, two prescripts. Accentuate your differentiation. All right. Very good. Okay. Andrew, final words. I think 2022 is going to be the year to really focus on talent. You just, things are going crazy. You can't grow without great people. We've all heard about the great resignation. Um, focus on developing your people, being human with them. I think Grant, you said that. To me, the big challenge of 2022 is actually going to be with teams and talent. I love it. And so we covered that. You got to take care of your customer all the way through, be a really good listener. And then we talk, Andrew brings it home with the employees first. Of course, in my book, we talk about employees are your first target. But as marketers, we really have a lot more impact with the brand than we think on um, both the retention and recruiting. All right. So thank you, Grant, Allie, Andrew. You're all great sports. And thank you, audience, for staying with us. Renegade Marketers Live is produced by Melissa Caffrey for show notes, past episodes, and the latest on my new book, Renegade Marketing, 12 Steps to Building Unbeatable B2B Brands. Please visit renegade.com. I'm your host, Drew Neiser. And until next time, keep those renegade thinking caps on and strong.